everybody. Welcome to this press, press briefing. This is a briefing on the budget, and I have with me the uh, lead on Treasury Matters in Policy and Resources, Deputy Mark Hellier, and also the State's Treasurer, uh, Bethan Haynes. But uh, we start off, I suppose we could say it's an extraordinary year, also a dreadful year, a terrible year. Uh, look what it's done to the global economy, and Guernsey has suffered uh, as well in relation to its financial position. That said, we have uh, recovered from, but well, we've still got a long way to go, from COVID and we've weathered the storm very well, uh, both financially and otherwise. But here we're, today, we're talking about financial matters. Now, who would have thought a year or so ago, uh, or even back in springtime, that we'd be closing businesses down, telling people they couldn't work, uh, and that we'd be facing the consequences of that today? Now, of course, when this budget was being promulgated uh, a year ago, when that budget for this year was being promulgated a year ago. We were looking at recovery from the 2008 crash. We had surpluses. We had money in the bank. We now face challenges that have been unparalleled financially in peacetime. We've got a tourist industry that's been almost non-existent this year. We've got a travel industry that will be suppressed for a period of time. We have massive, massive challenges. And this budget recognises that. But this budget also looks forward uh, in a way that uh, we believe will be constructive uh, to uh, take the bailiwick and particularly the island of Guernsey out of the financial crisis that uh, the world has uh, uh, caused uh, for us all to suffer. Now, uh, as I say, there are simple budget proposals. Uh, Deputy Hellier will be leading on the budget. He will be speaking on the budget and being its lead when the matter comes before the states in December. So I now turn to you, Mark, to take us through the various proposals. Thank you, Peter. So, as, as Deputy Furbrush has made clear, it's been a year like no other. And we now face economic challenges unlike any that the island had faced in many decades. Firstly, let me say now that we do realise how difficult a year this has been for some in our community. Unable to trade in the normal way, struggling to generate income and having to rely on government support. Given those challenges, I will say now, the budget we are about to present does not propose any new taxes at this time. And it also does not propose any major increases in existing taxes. Despite the challenges that we've faced, our economy has held up better than we might have expected. Some sectors, uh, sectors have bounced back very quickly following the lockdown, such as construction and the property market. Unemployment soared by Guernsey standards earlier this year, but it's already down to nearly the same very low levels that we saw before COVID. These are real positives, but we need to be honest and realistic with the community and with ourselves as a government. We face major deficits this year, next year and beyond. And in having to use our reserves, we've effectively been selling off the family silverware in order to fill the gap. I met with political colleagues this morning to present this budget to them, and my message was very clear. We cannot spend in the way that the States has spent up to now. Now, I'm going to run you through some slides which will uh, detail some of the specific provisions in the budget, and Bethan will help to um, explain some of the capital provisions that go on behind it. So our economy has been pretty resilient. We've been very lucky, particularly with the financial services sector, that they've been able to pick up laptops, go home, carry on working, and also not to call on financial support from the government. And this has made a huge difference to the economy. Our GVA forecast, which is a measure of how effective the economy is being, is to contract by 6 to 8% in 2020, but we're expecting it to bounce back by 35 to 4% next year. Unemployment is down, as I said, from 5.2% in May now down to 1.8% in October, and that's just 0.1% higher than it was pre-COVID. So that's a very good news story. Document duty from conveyancing is up. Um, there's, there's been a lot of sales in the, in the market, and we expect it to be up by 15% by the year end. Construction, IT, professional services, and real estate paid more in total wages in Q3 of 2020 than it did for the same period the year before. A fall in tax revenues, 
from finance sector jobs is a worry. We are seeing signs that the tax take from that particular sector has slowed. Now, it's too early to say, because of the way in which the, the data is, uh, is collected, whether that is due primarily to reconstruction uh, and, and cutting of jobs, or whether it's due, for example, to profit shares being restricted or to bonus pools being stopped. There's also a considerable amount of uncertainty in the budget and in, in planning around the hostelry and the transport sectors. What does the budget mean for the public? As I've already said, there will be no major increases and there will be no new taxes. Now is not the right time to punish a struggling economy. There will be a £300 increase in personal tax allowances to 11875 the effect of this is to keep pensioners outside of the tax net. There will be 1.5%, which is uh, the retail price index, increases for fuel, alcohol, and tobacco. Now, the effects of, of, of putting on RPIX is to effectively maintain the tax take at the same level, allowing for inflation. 0.6p a pint and 1.1p on a litre of fuel. That, again, is equivalent to 1.5% RPIX. Similarly, for TRP, there have been laddered increases and some quite major increases in TRP in the commercial and domestic sector over the past few years. We, we also believe that now is not the right time to impose additional tax hikes. TRP has been frozen for hostelry and food outlets and for self-catering accommodation. These sectors have been suffering and uh, this is a government responding to an area where we think no further pressure is required on those sectors. There will be a continuation of the gradual increase in other accommodation and TRP. So let's look at the cost of COVID. There is an income shortfall uh, of tax take effectively of 30 million this year and we're budgeting for a 16 million loss next year in comparison to 2019. We've spent 52 million on business support during 2020. We're budgeting for 17 million further for 2021 for business support, for border testing, and for the rollout of vaccine. Uh, Five million of that, for example, is for the purchase of vaccines. 24 million is the loss forecast for the operation of Orany this year. It's a very significant sum. Next year, uh, we're budgeting for that loss to be 14 million. Now, I'd have to say, uh, to urge caution in some of these numbers, there are forecasts. They're obviously reliant on, on projections of how quickly the economy will, will recover, and particularly how quickly transport will return to normal. And that, at the moment, is very, very difficult to forecast accurately. The ports, obviously, because of the lack of uh, transport movement, have suffered significantly as well. There's a 12 million loss this year, and we expect it to be 7 million next year. I'll just hand over now to Beth Ann, who will be talking through the budget overview with some of the more detailed figures. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so having applied the committee's policy decisions and updated all the forecasts, the table um, in front of you shows the um, overall budget position for 2021 in the column on the left hand side. It also shows the 2020 position. Um, both the budget on the right hand side and the middle column is now where we're expecting to end up this year. And I'll just talk you through 2020 first before going on to 2021. So as Deputy Hellier said, we're expecting um, income to be 30 million less than budget this year. Um, although this is a 6% shortfall against our budget, it is an improvement of some £8 million on the forecasts that we put in place during the lockdown earlier on in the year and shows the benefit of having opened the economy faster. So the shortfall is made up largely of um, income tax set to be £35 million lower than budgeted, but um, that's offset by um, strong document duty uh, receipts in the second half of the year, which are expected to be three million pounds up against budget, and customs duties, which net overall show a three million pound improvement against budget, um, largely through tobacco and um, alcohol. Um, the impact of no duty free or very limited duty free this year is, is having a positive in impact on state's finances. Turning to expenditure for this year, Overall, um, committee expenditure is expected to be in line with budget. So there have been impacts of COVID, 
um, some shortfalls on operating income and additional specific p costs, particularly in HSC relating to the purchase of PPE and the testing. Um, but these have been offset by lower expenditure elsewhere. As you'd expect, the claims for income support are up significantly. We had 1,300 additional claims during the lockdown period. And by way of example, the total number of active cases in August this year was over 400 higher than the same period last year. So overall, we're expecting expenditure to be £4.3 million or 10% higher than budget. Um, during the year, um, committees have um, altered their plans as a result of COVID and managed to return budget um, to Treasury so that it can be reallocated for other matters. And um, this has been used to, to fund testing at the borders and preparation for the vaccine programme. Moving on to um, specific COVID costs, the total costs of business support in this year have been 52 million. Uh, the majority of that in payroll co-funding, um, but also in specific support for the visitor accommodation sector. And Deputy Hellyer has already mentioned the, um, the losses incurred by Orini this year, which are likely to be £14 million higher than budgeted. So overall, we're looking at a deficit for 2020 of £59 million. Moving on to 2021, <clears throat> overall we have a budget for income of 463 million pounds which includes two million pounds of capital returns i would place caution on this number um, our estimates are based on the best information indicators and forecasts available at the time of compiling the budget and are clearly subject to change should circumstances change in our environment however one benefit of the budget coming later this year is that um, we've been able to use um, more of the year's tax receipts to, to help inform our estimates and have been able to use the quarter three information. So based on the data that we've collected, we've assumed modest recovery on part of, of part of the downturn experience this year. And our budget aligns with the latest economic forecasts, which Deputy Hellier mentioned, uh, expecting GVA to bounce back by between three and a half and four percent next year. Um, so while there is strong recovery in certain sectors, such as construction, um, the latest remuneration data show signs of stress in the finance sector, and this has been built into our um, income forecasts. And overall, uh, the 2021 budget sees a return to um, revenue income similar to the 2019 budgeted levels. On the expenditure side, um, revenue expenditure is set to increase by £20 million, or about 5% above the budget for this year. This includes some baseline pressures, obviously an allowance for inflation, um, demand pressures for, for service changes, and £8.5 million of service developments, the majority of which were agreed by the states since the last budget. And this includes £5 million for the implementation of NICE drugs and treatments. We've also got £2.5 two and, two and million for service developments that were agreed this year but haven't yet been implemented. Deputy Heller has already mentioned the £17 million worth of um, COVID-related costs for next year that we've estimated. Um, and again, this is the, the best information that we have at this point in time. And finally, we've made a provision of £14 million for Orini's losses. Um, but again, caution should be, should be placed there because any change in travel restrictions could see that deficit rise even further. So we're looking at a deficit overall for the states for general revenue in 2021 of £23 million. So I've just taken you through a um, deficit of £59 million in 2020 and £23 million in 2021, a total of £82 million which needs to be found and funded. The Policy and Resources Committee is proposing funding this through a combination of our core investment reserve and the general revenue account reserve. So during 2020, the states approved using up to £100 million of the core investment reserve to fund business support. PNR is now proposing that £50 million of that is used. Um, the remainder, £32 million, will be funded from the General Revenue Account Reserve. 
which is the reserve that's used to, to manage sort of um, overs and unders in our budget and holds the surplus that's been unallocated from 2019. Now, normally we would see um, capital transfers uh, as part of any of our budgets, and we would have expected a cap capital transfer of £40 million in 2020, and the fiscal policy framework would have seen a further £49 million in 2021. However, the only way of funding capital uh, transfers at this time would be either increasing the drawdown from the, capital, uh, from the core investment reserve or through borrowing. Therefore, the Policy and Resources Committee is recommending, as a short-term measure, that no transfers are made to the capital reserve in 2020 or 2021. However, PNR is proposing significant increases in the allocations to minor capital um, in the years for 2021 to 2024. Um, so this is allocated to categories such as medical equipment, coastal defences, property, and um, is allocated to facilitate rolling replacement, maintenance and improvement programmes. The, the small nature of these schemes means that they should be able to be delivered swiftly and the high numbers of smaller projects should provide opportunities for local contractors. In total, it's proposed that an additional 68 million is allocated to minor capital, taking the total for 21 to 24 to 80 million pounds, which is obviously 20 million pounds per annum, an increase from what was previously 12 million pounds per annum. So these um, mine and capital uh, allocations will see more money put into areas that have immediate and tangible public benefits. They include money, as you said, for medical equipment, for coastal repairs, for roads. This means some of our infrastructure, such as the Havilah Slipway, will be fixed, generating work for local industry and mitigating the broken window effect. We believe we should look after the assets we have and it would only cost us more in the long term to let them continue to fall into disrepair. The big question for government and for our community, and it's one which is right up front and centre in this budget on the front page, is what level of public services should be provided and how much tax are we prepared to take from the economy and the community in order to provide these? Having spent a few weeks now with my head metaphorically under the bonnet, I can say that our tax base has reached the limit of what it can achieve. The government has committed to significant amounts of spending in the next five to 10 years, and the 80 to 130 million estimate above current revenues cannot be met from the current tax base. So we have a choice. We either cut our cloth and provide services at the level of revenue which we have at the moment, or we consider other forms of taxation. Now, the previous PNR committee had been to the states with proposals for a fiscal review. We now consider that that work is absolutely essential and must be uh, brought forward as soon as possible. The purpose of that review is to identify areas of possible additional taxation and to work out how much and how often you need to pull the levers in order to raise what amounts. Now, I'm not saying we're going to bring in additional taxes. What I am saying is we cannot afford what we've been committed to spend. In the meantime, we have to live within our means. This is not a COVID issue. This is an issue which is coming over the horizon at the island and the bailiwick anyway. It has merely been exacerbated by the financial effects of COVID. And we must now urgently take steps to ensure that if action is necessary, that it can be taken quickly and effectively. That this budget is not the answer to dealing with all of these challenges. It is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give you the opportunity, uh, members of the media, to ask questions. When you do, would you say who you are, please, and who you represent? Uh, I ask anybody who's listening to this to bear in mind the comments that just Mark has just uh, made, Deputy Helio has just made. We are at the beginning of a journey, which is going to be a difficult journey, and the people of the bailiwick, the people of Guernsey in particular, but the people of all, anybody who pays tax in the bailiwick is going to have to make a, a communicate with us. We're open to communication. We're open to any ideas. We're open to discussion. And the Policy and Resources Committee has said it will make itself available for 
uh, a public consultation uh, as to what kind of future it wants for the bailiwick. You cannot squeeze any more juice from the lemon, that's effectively what Deputy Helly was saying, uh, to uh, fund all or any of the figure that he's mentioned, the eye-watering figure of extra, extra, uh, extra expenditure uh, that's been uh, talked about in the States in the last year or so. That's just not possible. So decisions are going to have to be made. We will make those decisions once we've had the fiscal review and we will tell the public what we believe is the right thing. Ultimately, it's a matter for the Assembly as a whole. But we believe, as the Policy and Resources Committee, it's our responsibility to lead. Anyway, who'd like to, who'd like to start? Yes, sir. Uh, Rory O'Reilly from BBC Guernsey. First question is for you, Deputy Fairbrush. This is obviously a budget uh, which was worked on for months by the previous committee. Yep. I wonder how much of it was inherited and if you had more time to put your stamp on the budget, what you might have changed? It is largely inherited, but we have already put a, our stamp on it to a degree. But it's to... Uh, Deputy Heller talked about the, uh, the repairs at Havlet cows hall etc etc that's very much our stamp that's what we are bringing forward i mean it's an initial step it's only a little step albeit it's again when we talk about monies it's millions of pounds and also we have cut back for example in relation to trp it's except for the one category that deputy helio talked about it's either no increase or it's a cost of living increase one and a half percent we've done that as well with other with other uh, expenditure or extra tax on fuel etc because we do not believe that we can expect the public of Guernsey to dig further into their pockets than is absolutely necessary. So we've put a little bit of our own mark on it, but we've inherited it largely from the previous PNR. We're making no criticism of their considerable efforts. But I think next year's budget, whatever form it takes, and it might not be, a, 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 again, a hail and hearty budget. It will depend. It'll depend on what happens over the next 12 months. We'll very much ha uh, have our mark on it. Hey, Michalsko from my TV channel. You talk about uh, saying we can't afford what you've already been committed to spend. Would you say that the last states and the last PNR committee were fiscally irresponsible then? Well, certainly I was a member of the last states. Uh, I do not think they were fiscally irresponsible uh, because they balanced the budget. As I said initially, we come up with a balanced budget, a recovery from the 2008 crash, and also we had savings. As Deputy Helio said, we've had to spend some of those savings. But, but, and it was a point that Deputy Helio drew to my attention uh, when I made my, just before I made my statement to the uh, Assembly uh, a few weeks ago, uh, that there were too many, too many issues to be considered. And we're not going to be able to deliver on those. We don't intend to deliver on all of those because it's impossible. I don't know if you want to add anything on that, Mark. No, I, th <clears throat> I, I think the message ha has already been transmitted in the last states. I, I think Deputy St. Pierre and Deputy Trott both said very clearly that this was a problem coming over the horizon. The issue is that now we have a concertina effect because of the economic effects of COVID. Our reserves are being eroded. Um, we're, we're in an uncertain period. We've had to take out borrowing in order to manage liquidity against having to sell down investments. And all of those things added up now bring this into very sharp focus, which is why it's absolutely front and center in the budget. Uh, Bailiwick Express. Um, how fast or soon do you need to implement this uh, fundamental review of our, our tax system? Is there a timeline for this? It's already commenced. Uh, the first meetings have happened, and we, we will we will report back as soon as possible. But certainly within the next uh, within the next year. Um. Uh, Helen Bowditch from the Guernsey Press. Uh, you mentioned that Orini's deficit, I think you said 24 million this year and 14 million next year. So I wonder if I could ask you, what are your ideas um, for bringing those losses under stricter control? And would you look at um, some of the loss making routes? Mark, I think you're leading on that for Yes, I, I, I've well. already uh, discussed it at, at some length with, uh, with Deputy Roffey, with SCSB, and also economic development. Orini's issues are not just, an, uh, just, just cost wise. The, the, the strategy that's involved with, with air links and connectivity across a number of different areas. At the moment, uh, we've just had a new CEO start and a new chairman at the same time. Um, we have met with them and discussed some of these issues, and it's really for them to plan for, for us to give them the strategic expectations, but we would like the numbers not to be so high, I think it's fair to say. Also, I think your question also touches upon the wider issue of uh, air and sea links generally, albeit you didn't mention the sea, but I'm sure you would have done. Uh, but in relation to that, it will depend on the policy going forward. At the moment, we have an open skies policy in 
good. See, it may well be that that will have to be addressed, addressed significantly. But as Deputy Hellier has alluded to, that will be A, a decision overall and finally for the State's Assembly, but B, there will be discussions uh, with Economic Development and the State's Trading Supervisory Board, uh, again in which uh, Deputy Hellier will be leading. Anybody else with a question? We're talking about you know, using the Guernsey's money wisely and, and trying to find this £82 million. You've already committed £26 million to the Guernsey Dairy Project, and there's talk of this, uh, the work at the Landcrest Seawall costing upwards of a £1 million over the next decade. Is this sensible expenditure, considering the current circumstances? Well, the answer is that uh, there are no sacred cows. Things will be looked at uh, in connection with... Uh, I was president of the STSB until recently, and it's now in the very capable hands of Deputy Rothy. Uh, the dairy project will be looked at. I mean, it, it wasn't a commitment. The actual commitment was not to, to carry out the dairy project uh, at a cost of 26 million or whatever it may be. It was to go to the next stage to, to advance that. Uh, that in itself is not an inconsiderable sum. But there will be lots of things that will have to be looked at in the next 12 months and beyond. Because even after the fiscal review that Deputy Henley has talked about, A, we'll have to make decisions as to what we're going to do. B, that will have to work through the system. Uh, and C, a lot of, uh, uh, undoubtedly, because we are, uh, hopefully, I'm not uh, being self-proclaiming, we're a go-getting state, a go-getting uh, policy and resources committee. And we would see if the right business conditions are agendered, that uh, some of that growth, hopefully a lot of the growth of the income, will come from businesses realising they can operate here and operating efficiently in a, in a friendly environment. Do you want to add anything about that? Yes, I would. I've just, it's really important to differentiate between revenue and capital. We have capital in the bank. We have savings, effectively, in the bank that we can use for those types of projects. The, the pressure that we have on the state's accounts, on the public finances, are revenue. Mm -hmm. That's repeated things that we have to pay for year in, year out. And that, that's the area where we need to focus. Anyone else with a question? Given that Orini's place as a state-owned um, utility is for it to be an economic enabler, with the losses it's occurring, at what point does it stop becoming an economic enabler, and what point does it become a, uh, a drain that we can't um, continue with? Well, the, the trouble is that the states haven't actually decided that it is an economic enabler. Uh, they've decided it had a. The policy was that it should, uh, in, a, in a way, balance its books. It should be, uh, you know, it shouldn't cost the economy anything. That's clearly not realistic going forward. It will be an economic enabler, but the level of what it will be, it touches on uh, uh, Helen Baldish's question a, a minute or two ago as to what routes it will service, how, that in, how it fits in with uh, the, uh, the, the policy, the air travel policy that will be decided by this state in relatively early course. So it will depend. Uh, and uh, Deputy Helen has already uh, stated that uh, there have been discussions and that the management of Orly, both at chairman level and at chief executive level, uh, is brand new, uh, and uh, there'll be open discussions with them. Deputy Hellier said he's, he's already touched upon that. Anything else you want to add to that, Mark? No, I, I just agree that the, those losses are not sustainable. So something needs to be done, and that's what we're getting on with. Anyone else with a question? Yes, Helen. Um, this fiscal review seems really important, and I just wondered if I could ask you what's, what you're sort of leaning towards. Are you sort of leaning towards increasing taxes maybe for like, uh, high-income earners, people perhaps earning 50,000 plus, or are, you looking, or are you leaning more towards like a smaller, leaner government? The, the purpose of the review is to identify the, the, the levers that you can pull in order to raise tax and, and how much you need to pull the lever in order to do that. I suspect that if we do need to raise tax, that it will be over a, a several different techniques for doing so, um, so as to not put too much pressure on one part of the economy or not. My personal preference, I'm not speaking as a member of PNR, is that not to put tax up at all. I'd rather grow the economy um, uh, or, or save money. Um, but all of these things in, 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 in one part or another will come into play. Well, Deputy Helly will be pleased to know that I agree with him uh, in relation to that. So there's two of us. We just need one more vote we're there. But, I mean, no, not being facetious. The point is, uh, and Deputy Helly mentioned the 100, 130 million of extra revenue if everything that was on that list was uh, approved and followed through. It may be that certain items of that won't be for a variety of reasons, and other items of expenditure won't be that are already in the system. 
because there is a difference between capital and expenditure. Capital, you save up and you spend it prudently when you need to spend it on various things that are going to benefit the island in one way or another. Revenue expenditures are the killer because those have that money has to be found every year from uh, tax revenues. Quick question on the education proposals and how this budget might you know impact that moving forward. The education proposals. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, they are yet to be paid in the sense that uh, Deputy Dudley Owen and her team will come back in the next few months because there is the review that due to report March, April time, what other four or five months, whatever that may be. Uh, that will influence, no doubt, uh, the states, that will be put to the states, the states will make a decision, the decision as to how much that will cost capital-wise, how much that will cost revenue-wise, whether there could be any savings. So uh, that's an issue that will be addressed, uh, as I say, so we can't predict uh, with any degree of certainty what that will be. Is there a reliance on the finance industry during this particular time as, as far as supporting us uh, monetarily? And is this an open to um, uncertainty with what is happening in the rest of the world? Well, finance, and I'll be corrected by uh, Beth and or Mark if I, correct, if I stated correctly, it's 41% of our basic, 41% of our uh, GDP. And on top of that, there are the legal services and the other services that also wouldn't be uh, in the position they are without the finance sector. Uh, the state treasurer has already said that there have been a few, uh, not disconcerting, but if, uh, uh, the, the finance sector revenue returns, which means wages, bonuses, etc., may not be as buoyant next year as was originally anticipated. But of course, the finance sector will remain uh, a very important part of our economy. It has to. And we'll do everything that we can to protect it and enhance it. Do you want to add anything? Because you're all and it's to, I, I, would, I would only just reflect on the fact that it's been very COVID resilient as an industry. It's been able to, you know, pick up and and go home and and not rely on on financial support from the government. And that that's a, and so it's still paying tax, uh, which has been a huge help. Which is probably why our uh, the effect on GVA and or, or, or GDP, if you measure it that way, has been so much lighter than say if you take the UK, where I think the latest figures they were looking at 14 percent or higher. Mm. Uh, Kit Gilson, ITV News. Um, it's a new state and um, in, in the last few months, and let's face it, a few months ago, not all that long, then um, I'm sure the predictions of where we would be was vastly different to where we've managed to get ourselves in relation to COVID. And with um, a vaccine looking on the horizon, how's that factored into the budget, if at all? Well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the Treasurer has already said that they position is better than was anticipated before, more income has come in. But even when we look at the uh, the vaccines, there are now two, aren't there, that have been mooted. Uh, the first vaccine, if I could say that, the person who has uh, invented, produced, whatever word we use in relation to that, said he doesn't see the world economy bouncing back significantly uh, until next autumn. And uh, the other one is brand new. I mean, of course, we would like to get the economies up and running as quickly as possible. The sooner the better, the better it is for everybody. But uh, again, as the state treasurer has said, we can only make decisions on what we know now or what we can reasonably foresee. We were cautious as a civil contingencies authority in relation to uh, the policy about people coming into and going out of the bailiwick. That's proved to be exactly right. We're gonna be cautious in relation to the state's finances. But you know, good news is always welcome. question on, on testing and if it's costing so much money to test people on arrival coming in and out of Guernsey has there been any talk of maybe charging people for these services maybe giving leeway to people who have to travel for urgent medical appointments the uh, I think every consideration we've got point is what we'd rather is that people are properly tested uh, and that the bailiwick is kept safe we've got eight cases eight cases uh, now that's not to say we won't get some more but the, the because you could you know people are going to travel to the bailiwick uh, are they going to be tested? It may be that that would be looked at, but by saying maybe, I think the position at the moment is that we would rather that testing is done effectively and quickly, uh, and it would be a false economy to start charging people unrealistically. Do you think your budget will be po uh, popular with the public and your political colleagues? Uh, very good question, and very difficult, almost impossible to answer. Uh, budget's never popular with the public. Uh, and it's only what degree of uh, 
less popularity that you could have really. The people in the bailiwick have showed themselves over the COVID, over the last nine or ten months, to be remarkably sensible, overwhelmingly sensible. They know that, the, that we're in a better position, as we've said, than most other communities throughout the world. Uh, I think if they're sensible, which I believe they are, they realise that there's only so much that we could do. As to our political colleagues, we gave a presentation to them earlier today. It seemed to be constructively received, but we'll see by the number of amendments that we may well face on Budget Day and how sensible those are and how many of them succeed or otherwise. Uh, ultimately, as Deputy Hellier said to our political colleagues this morning, it's a matter for the Assembly. We can only present a budget and it'll be for the Assembly to decide whether to accept it or otherwise. I do not think, and I'm making my own comment here, not for anybody else, I do not think the public of Guernsey would see uh, the state's members being responsible if they suddenly foist uh, upon the people of Guernsey extra, uh, extra revenue expenditure and extra capital expenditure which cannot effectively be met at the moment. Do you want to add anything? And only just to, to reiterate that when, when we spoke to colleagues this morning, the, I, I finished up by saying that every request for more revenue is a request to raise taxes. Yeah, that's the point. Anything else? More, if you like. Um, yep. You said that GVA, uh, I think you said you're, you're predicting that to go up next year by 3.5 to 4 percent. I'm not quite sure how, how GVA sort of relates to GDP, but I just thought. That sounds quite rosy in the context that we're in now that, you know, we might not get these um, vaccines until the autumn. So I mean, are you confident that you've done your sums right? Mark will deal with that. But let me just say, let me put it into context. A 6 to 8 percent decrease this year, uh, I think for the, when, the, when you had the budget grass, it decreased by something like 2.6, 2.8 percent. So we're still talking about, even if it bounces back 3.5 to 4 percent, which would be a great result it would still be significantly down on uh, where it was. Mark? And I, I haven't done the sums personally, but I've been uh, very impressed with the forecasting work that's been done at, at Treasury, uh, and I'm particularly happy that it's always been on the conservative side. Um, I would much rather get the numbers wrong in the right direction, if you yeah. know what I mean, and, and, um, and let's hope that that's right for these ones as well. But I just make that point, and I agree entirely, 100% with that, that the figures have been done cautiously, but sensibly cautiously. I don't want people to think, oh, well, there'll be 20 million, 30 million, 40 million pounds better off as a result of, uh, you know, because we've underquoted. That isn't the case at all. If that happens, that is absolutely fantastic. But that is not certain. Anybody else with a question? I'm looking around, nobody else with any questions? Then thank you, everybody, very much. And uh, we hope and I'm sure that you'll be reporting our uh, budget proposals uh, constructively. Thank you very much.